In this video, we're diving into Amazon's real income statement to show you exactly how to read and analyze it in just a few minutes. Forget the fictitious examples with lemonade stands, here we're using the real financials of companies. So whether you're a student, a working professional, or just a curious investor, we'll break down all of the key numbers and ratios you need to know. Let's get into it. First up, let's quickly define the income statement, and it's one of the three main financial statements alongside the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. It tells us for a specific point in time, like a year or a quarter, what were the company's revenues minus all of its expenses to reach its profit or net income. And here's a sample income statement below, and you can see it's got several subtotals before it reaches the net income at the very bottom. That's just a simplified example, so let's see where we can find Amazon's actual income statement. You want to go to a form called a 10k, you can just look up Amazon form 10k, and from here in the table of contents, we want to scroll to this area called financial statements and supplementary data. Within it, you just want to scroll a bit lower down and you should be able to find the three main financial statements. And right now we're looking at the consolidated statement of operations, which is actually the same thing as the income statement. For the revenue here, they call it the total net sales. That's basically the same thing. And you notice it's further broken down into net product sales and net service sales. If you're not sure what this breakdown entails, so what are products and what are services, we can do a quick search by pressing Ctrl F and just looking for net sales. When you do that, you should be able to find if we scroll lower down, this breakdown over here where it says net sales include products and services. The products represent revenue from the sale of products and related shipping fees. I imagine this means selling their physical goods, like for example, their books and the shipping fees associated with them. Then we've got these service sales a bit lower down and you can see that these include things like advertising services, the Amazon Prime membership fee, etc. On top of that, if we scroll lower down, we can see the breakdown by the region. You can see here we've got the net sales in North America and international as well. So it looks like North America does account for the majority of the sales. As you've seen, this Form 10K provides a lot more information than just say going to Yahoo Finance as you can see over here where all we get is the total revenue, and we don't really get an explanation as to what that entails. Awesome, all of this revenue information gets us to our first analysis part, which is the year-over-year -year growth. Let's take a look at how to calculate that. You can see here, I just have a table in Excel with the product sales, the service sales, and the total sales. So to calculate the year-over-year -year product sales growth, all I need to do is type equals, select the current year, so it would be this figure over here. We want to divide that by the previous year and minus one. To make sure Excel doesn't make a mistake, I'm just going to wrap it here in parentheses to separate that and hit enter. Now I can just copy that, shift down, shift right, and to paste only the formula, I can just press control alt V. And within this area, I'm only looking to paste the formulas, not the formatting, so you can see what that looks like. Overall, it seems like the growth rates are quite high, especially for a company of this size. In this scenario, Amazon has over 600 billion in revenue. The reason I say billion here is if we go to the income statement again, you'll notice that it says the figures are in millions. So that means that this figure over here isn't actually 637 million, but rather we need to equals, select that, and we just want to times it by 1 million. That will give us the actual number. So you can see there that it's 637 billion. I'm just gonna press Ctrl Z there to go back. Great, we've just gone over the revenue side and now we can take a look at the operating expenses, which is all of this area down below. Some companies though have a further breakdown. For example, here we can see Apple's income statement and they actually have the operating expenses split into two parts, the cost of sales side and the operating expenses side. If we take a look at Amazon's, it's slightly different where they just put the cost of sales inside of the operating expenses. All right, that's all great, but what are these cost of sales for Amazon? It's also known as the cost of goods sold, and they're basically the direct costs associated with a revenue generating activity. So in Amazon's case, it could be the inventory, so the buying of the books to then be able to sell them. It could also be for the licensing fee for streaming, etc. Following that, we've got fulfillment, which is the warehousing costs, the warehousing staff, etc. 
And like I've mentioned before, we can't see a lot more of an explanation. So again, press Ctrl F and I can just look for cost of sales. When I do that, you'll see here that I'm gonna get a full breakdown. So it defines what cost of sales are. Same thing with fulfillment down below, which you can see are the costs incurred in operating and staffing the different fulfillment centers. And if we keep scrolling down, we'll see the next section, which is technology and infrastructure. This is basically another way for them to define R&D, which is research and development. In this case, it would be like the cost of hiring all of the different engineers. After that, we've got sales and marketing, which is fairly self-explanatory and general and administrative. It's also known as GNA. This is basically all of the different office costs as well as the office workers. Finally, we've got other operating expense or income net, which you can see is a fairly small line item, but it's a bit of a catch-all bucket that if we try to find further information on by typing other operating expense, we can see if we find a match. And there we go down below over here, it's showing that it's primarily related to asset impairments and amortization of intangible assets. In case you don't know what an asset impairment is, it's basically the reduction of an asset's value. For example, Amazon could overpay for a specific company, and if that company underperforms, it's going to write it down as an asset impairment. All of this then takes us to our operating income, so let's take a look at some ratios associated with it. We've already seen the year-over-year -year growth, so the next ratio is typically the gross margin ratio also known as the gross profit ratio. The gross profit is simply the revenue minus the cost of goods sold or cost of sales. That gives us the gross profit and we would just need to divide that by the revenue. In Amazon's case, it's around the 49% mark, which means that for every dollar in revenue, Amazon retains 49 cents after covering the cost of sales. This might seem like a low number, but in reality for retailers, it's definitely on the high side. If we compare it to Walmart, for instance, they have a gross margin ratio of around 25%. That means they only retain about 25 cents on every dollar they make in revenue. The reason Amazon's is a fair bit higher is because they also have the service side business with things like Amazon Web Services as well as Prime Video. Another common ratio is the operating margin. The formula here is just the operating income divided by the revenue. And this tells us how efficiently a company generates profits from its core business operations. This operating income is also sometimes referred to as EBIT, so earnings before interest and taxes. Awesome, now continuing with the income statement, we have the interest parts. There is interest income, so money coming in. And this is typically from investing your excess cash into things like marketable securities or money market funds. That interest that you get is what's shown here. Then we've got the interest expense side, which is primarily the interest you have to pay on your outstanding debt. Finally, there's the other income, which is a bit of a catch-all bucket, and that takes us to the income before taxes. That's also known as EBT, which is short for earnings before taxes. Following that, there is the income taxes, and you can see here they're known as a provision for income taxes. This is because they're an estimate and not the actual amount they'll pay. Finally, there is one line item called equity method investing activity net of tax. It's quite a small number, but this is when Amazon invests in another company but doesn't own the majority. For example, they invested about 17% in Rivian, so we would need to recognize its portion of Rivian's gains or losses in its earnings. Finally, that takes us to the net income figure, also known as the bottom line, as it's the last line item on the income statement. As you can see in 2022, Amazon had a net loss, but now in 2024, that figure has gone all the way up to 60 billion in profit. And one common mistake with annual reports is that in Amazon's case, you can see it's going from 2022 to 2024, but in Apple's case over here, it's actually flipped, where the most recent one is 2024, and then it goes backwards. So when comparing companies, it's important to make that distinction. Looking at the ratios now, there's two main ones to keep in mind to do with net income. Over here, we've got the net margin first, which tells us the percentage of revenue that's left after paying for all of the expenses. So how much of the company's revenue is Amazon able to turn into profit? In Amazon's case, we can try to calculate that down below here in Excel in this yellow area. So it's just gonna be the net income divided by the total net sales. 
that's gonna be this bigger and shift right control R there to drag that to the right and you can see as of 2024 it's 9.3% and it's really made a lot of progress over the years and you might think having a 9% net margin is quite low but if you consider Amazon to be a retailer this is definitely on the high side the other key ratio to consider is the EPS, which is short for earnings per share. It basically tells us how much in profit Amazon earns for each share outstanding. And the simplified formula is just the net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. However, you might have noticed in Amazon's income statement, it says this basic part and this diluted part. Same thing with the shares outstanding. We've got the basic ones and the diluted. So what does that mean? The diluted one is more conservative as it considers the dilution of shares from things like stock options. Typically, Amazon pays its employees in the form of stock options as well as a salary. So that means that if they want to, they can exercise or they can use that stock option to create a new share in the company. In turn, if you have more shares in the market, but you have the same earnings amount, that's going to dilute the actual earnings per share. So it's going to decrease it. If we look here at the income statement again, you'll notice the diluted earnings per share is generally lower than the basic earnings per share. Looking further down at the number of shares used, you can see that in the basic, the number is lower than it is in the diluted amount as that's accounting for things like the stock options I just mentioned. So again, the diluted EPS is generally more conservative and it also means it's probably gonna be a lower number than the basic EPS. Awesome! If you like this teaching style and you want to learn more things like financial accounting, corporate finance, valuation, and even financial modeling in Excel, I'd recommend you check out our complete finance and valuation course where you learn all of these essentials. In the course, first we'll cover financial statement analysis using Apple's real annual report as an example. Then we'll get into financial modeling through a three statement model. After that, we'll begin the valuation phase where you learn to do a discounted cash flow, a comparable company's valuation, and a precedent transactions valuation, looking at their real financial statements to eventually derive a valuation range. Lastly, we'll show you how to present an investment thesis in stock pitch format. So if you're interested in checking this out, head over to the link in the description below. One key distinction that a lot of people fail to understand is that net income is not the same as cash flow. If you want to understand that better, you should watch this video over here on the cash flow statement or take our financial accounting course over here. Hit that like and that subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.